nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. But why will you say that I'm mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I have heard all things in heaven and in the earth. I have heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken, and observe how healthily, how calmly, I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object? There was none. Passion there was none. I, I, I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. And whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man, and thus rid myself of the eye forever. And this is the point where you fancy me mad. <laughs> mad men know nothing. You should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dis... <laughs> I'm so sorry, she's doing the eye. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Lady Lovelace, are you enjoying the presentation? Yes. Oh. It's my favorite Christmas story! Oh. <laughs> would, you, would you care to assist? <laughs> oh, do! <laughs> yes, do we. Yes, we shall turn this into a dramatic presentation, Lady Lovelace, and you shall be playing the old man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good eye, good eye. Mad men know nothing, you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every... No, this is not my idea. I can't play the protagonist and the narrator at the same time. I need a... I need a pat A pat I need a pat Yeah. Oh, here, here. So far, yes. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, just about midnight, I turned the latch on his door and I opened it. Oh, so gently. And then. When I've made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed so that no light shone out, and then I thrust in my head. You would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I would not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. And would a madman have been so wise as this? <laughs> And then, when my head was well within the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously, the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I would go boldly into the chamber and speak courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he passed the night. So you see, he would have had to have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in on him. Is that entirely appropriate? Probably not. Right then. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watcher's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, my sagacity. I should, I could barely contain my feelings of triumph to think that there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he, not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts, why, I should fairly chuckle with the idea. And perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. You may think I drew back, but no. The room was black as pitch with the thick darkness. The shutters were closed, fastened for fear of robbers. So I knew he could not see the opening of the door, so I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in and was just about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening. The old man sprang up in bed, crying out, Who's there? Who's there? Very good. <laughs> I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle. 
And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting in the bed listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death marches of the wall. Um, the crowd is my brother moved back a bit. It's going to get a bit dangerous. Presently, I heard a slight groan. I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or grief. Oh no, it was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. Can you do that, Lady Lovelace? Let's hear your moan of awe. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that is a moan of algebra. Oh. Oh. A moan of awe. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you did say algebra. All right. <laughs> oh. Very good, yes. I knew the sound well. Many nights, just at the night when all the world slept, it had welled up within my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. Let's hear your moan of all. <laughs> oh! <laughs> there you are. Oh, That's all. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since that first slight noise when he turned from the bed. His fears had been ever since been growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but he could not. He had been saying to himself, Oh, it's holding up the wind in the chimney. It's just a mouse crossing the floor. What? Or it's merely a cricket that has made a single chirp. Chirp. Yes. <laughs> He had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he found all in vain, all in vain, because death, in approaching him, had stuck, uh, uh, stuck his black shadow before him, and he fell out the victim. And it was the mournful influence of this unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a very, very little crevice in the land. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily. Until, at length, a single dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot out from the crevice and fell full upon the vulture eye. It was open! Wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw with perfect distinctness all the dull blue with a hideous veil over the children and marrow in my bones. I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person. I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but an over-acuteness of the senses? Now I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such the sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. As a matter of fact, I was beating of a heart. Just to keep it soft. But even then, I refrained and I kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the man lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker, and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous, and so I am. But now, at the dead hour of night, amidst the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. And yet, for some minutes longer, I
he was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. Now, if you still think me mad, you will think so no longer. Good night. <laughs> if you still think me mad, he just killed someone. <laughs> if you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for concealment of the body that I weighed and I worked hastily but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. <laughs> Then I took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and I deposited them all between the scantlings. I replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot, but sir, I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. When I had made an end to these labors, it was four o'clock. Still dark as midnight, as the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart. But what had I to fear? There entered three men who would introduce themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. Uh, you see. <laughs> a shriek had oh, been I heard by you don't understand. A shriek had been heard during the night. Um, suspicion of foul play had been aroused, information had been lodged at the police officers, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled. For what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was but my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I made them search. Search round! I led them at my, to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the wild enthusiasm of my countenance, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I, in the very audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat beneath which the reposed the corpse of the victim. <clears throat> the officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was seemingly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted up to the things. Before long, I found myself growing pale and wishing gone. My head ached. I fancied a ring in my ears. Still they sat and still they chatted. The ring became more distinct. It continued and it became more distinct. So I talked more freely, got to the feeling that it continued, and it gained definitiveness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very quiet, so I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, and yet the sound increased. And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, such the sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. <laughs> I gasped for breath, yes, you understand. And the officers heard it not, so I talked more quickly, more vehemently, and the noise steadily increased. I arose, and I argued about trifles in a high key with violence, the uh, violent situations, and the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor, to and fro, with every stride, and was excited and fury by the observations of these men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what can I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore, I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting, and I grated it upon the floorboards, but the noise Take the paper, 